We are at 40. And we lost it. I just tell my friends here that I designed this. Okay, cool. So I'm just installing the drip kit for the Corvette. Currently I have my lower control arm in the lowest anti-squat position. You can see here I have these four options now with this bracket. One interesting thing that we have to note is in the lowest setting I have to have these offset spacers different lengths because when I rotate the arm down, the control arm has a radius and as it rotates the control arm gets tighter inside of this subframe because as I rotate it down, the arm gets closer to this side of the mount. I don't know if I explained that well enough, but basically as I raise and lower the height of this, it changes the type of spacers that I need. So I have these offset spacers made. And if I want to run in the factory position, I need to install the central ones like so. So this is in the highest anti-squat position and it won't actually go down because like I just explained the radius. So if I want it to go in the lowest position, I have to swap these out. destructive testing some Corvette components. This is a new Corvette upper control arm that's going to be designed for factory upper replacement with high clearance. The biggest issue with the Corvette is the coilover goes through the arm so it's really difficult to get a lot of good clearance. So we're testing the strength of the arm, the welded connections, and then these uh, studs that connect to the chassis. We're making sure that it's all going to be able to with, withstand our minimum threshold. Taking guesses, my assumption is this arm should probably see four to 5,000 without any major uh, issues, which is way beyond what it'll ever see in a racing use application, way more. So we're just going to go until we break it. This ram is able to produce 20,000 pounds of force. Um, the ram is basically here and it pulls on this fulcrum, which is on a bearing on the table. The table is kind of all built into it with this blast glass to protect us. I'm going to say 69,000. All right. Well, we're already at 1,800 pounds, so it's doing pretty good. Somebody needs to keep an eye on the weight so I can watch what's going on with the arms. So we've reached 3,500 pounds. Because it's an A-frame, what you're going to have is compression on one side of the arm and you're going to have tension on the other. We've got compression here, tension here. You can kind of see it's pushing this heim joint down into the table and it's trying to pull this one off. We're at 4,000 pounds now. We're at 4,300. We're at 4,500. I can kind of see it pulling the heim joint away from the stud.
We are at 47 and we lost it. It pulled it off of the, this flare. Relieve the pressure. So at like 48, the first pass, like, like there was no movement at all in the welded joints. So basically this arm design has, you can see here it says front top. This is just a reference to the position. So this is the front of the control arm and this is the top side. The way that this arm is designed is it has like an insert that gets tapped inside of the bung and then it's butt welded. So it's got a mechanical constraint where the arm is actually pushed inside of the bung and then we weld it like a butt weld. This gives us a lot better clearance for the coilover to go through and then lots of clearance for the arm. These studs hold the heim joint all the way on the inside. The factory arm mounts with a bushing in the middle of these two holes where we've offset the heim joint all the way to the inside to give it a lot better clearance, again, for the wheel. So basically what happened there was we were pulling on it so hard that it actually squeezed these heim joints together and it made the heim joint jump uh, over top of this flare. And it looks like the flare is actually fine because these are hardened steel studs. It looks like it probably just pulled it and it might have actually just damaged the heim joint itself. So it would have been an easy repair. I mean, you'll never see that much weight unless you're in an accident, but yeah, everything held up really well. Uh, so I'm putting on my air jacks on the front corners. I had to do a couple mods, I'll show you. So the Corvette's ride height is approximately four and a half to five inches from this frame rail to the ground ride height. When I had this mounted under the frame rail, it would have put this shoe like three and a half, four inches above the ground, not gonna work. So I chopped it to fit the frame rail. I printed off a template from my computer because I just created a plane here and made it perfect. So I could just trace that and cut that. So basically now this, goes on here like that and that tightens up and you've got your air jack in this corner this is just above the frame rail so this won't be you know the lowest point of the car that is important for ground clearance catching on things and all that sort of stuff but you want the air jack you want to utilize the most potential lift that it's gonna to have to offer so you want it to be close to the bottom of your frame rails anyways I uh, measured from this point to this plate and then from this point to this plate like this and then I put those marks on the frame rail on the other side so that I can nail the other side perfectly symmetrical to this side. And then we're going to get Cam who's building this GR roll cage right now to tack it while I make sure it's level. So I'm going to put this into the other bracket. I have a digital level. We're gonna make sure it's bang on 90, 90, or 89.9 and 89.9, because that thing doesn't, it'll never do 90. It does like one or 89.9, it's, you'll see. All right, so I'm going to slap this together, like so. Make sure I got full thread engagement on the bottom. Hey, yo, Cam! Don't get too comfortable. <laughs> Gotta love when you have employees. All right, so I have this mark here and I have this mark here and we're gonna line up those two points best we can. That's all we asked for. And we're gonna tack this lower corner because if I tack the lower corner, I can still move it like this and I can still get it level. Bottom corner, please. Ooh. Metrics here. Uh oh, that's not square. Kim, retack me. Oh, 89.9. Oh, it says 90. Uh oh, we're in trouble. Okay, tack the top. Let me see. 89.8 and 89.9. There you go. Done. We're off by 0 0.01 of a degree. Throw me a tack there. What happened here? Dude, yo, yo, it's not bolted, man. Oh. It's held up by a piece of welding wire. Relax. 
Do you think three tacks will pick up this car with the boat uh, anchor in it? Yep. No. No? Think it'll blow them off? It'll at least peel one, which will then result in the other two also peeling. Should off. we try? Okay, three good tacks. I've been closing my eyes and sniping them, so I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, should we do that? Maybe. It might be. Maybe not. Oh, it'll take too long to start. Right. I, you guys got excited. We're good to weld it now. Okay. I wanted to make sure we get. Because there's different things on this side. They're not I like. Sure the I wanted to make spot. sure that this is going to work. So okay. it's good. You're, it's good to go. We'll show you guys lifting the car later. This is one of the parts that I've been waiting to talk about on our YouTube series. The rear suspension setup has been one of my favorite to design, to put together, and to just play with. It's really gonna be difficult to go over all of the changes and benefits and things that I've done based on my experience drifting and applying it here, but I will do my best to go over everything. So, the rear suspension has a insane amount of travel range, way more than will ever be usable with a coilover. The current ride height right now, this car would be like a foot and a half to two feet off the ground, so it'll never be here. The ride height is actually when these arms are, when the lower arm is perfectly parallel, that's what your ride height's gonna be. At full droop, it's gonna be somewhere around here. And then at full compression, it's gonna be somewhere up here, which would literally be subframe on ground. A couple things to go over. Probably one of the coolest things would be these arms can be removed super fast. We should take a shot of just me zapping the lower off and then putting it back on. We'll do that. These arms can be taken off really quickly. The best part about it is they can be taken off without taking the heim joints out of the subframe. If you've ever seen someone fiddling around with their suspension on a Formula Drift live stream during a five minute timeout, it is most of the time trying to fiddle those spacers in between the two subframe ears and then one of them falls out and they're picking it up and there's you're stressed and everything no leave the heim joint leave the spacers leave it all in the subframe you zap this adjuster off you just blast it right off and the whole arm comes off and then you can put it right back on leaving the heim joints installed um, some people online were referencing how small these arms seem they're actually very thick and, and pretty big, but this material that we use is a high strength alloy steel, four times stronger than mild steel. Looking at how this would behave if it was just regular mild steel, I understand. You might think, yeah, that's just gonna fold. Uh, it won't, it's extremely strong. You guys saw the upper in the first part of this video. 40 on how that holds up. This is the same material, but thicker on the, both the upper and the lower, so I have zero concern for the integrity of this suspension. This toe bracket is integrated with the dual caliber bracket and it bolts onto the knuckle. This reduces the cost and manufacturing of the knuckle. It makes the knuckle itself lighter, more modular. The knuckle is left and right. Both sides are the same, they're symmetrical. So I just take this knuckle, flip it, put it on that side, done. The toe brackets are what have the left and right side specific. This is a left side toe bracket. This bracket will fail before the knuckle will be damaged. That is by design, and also it holds my brake caliper mounts, which fit nicely with my Willwood rotor, which I will throw on in a bit. So that's a cool part about the knuckle. I took the ball joints that are normally mounted this way, and I turned them 90 degrees for both the upper and the lower. The reason I did that is because it allows for more articulation and it allows for a cheaper manufacturing cost again on the knuckle where I can put a double shear mount machine out of aluminum extremely strong plus I can have these really fancy camber adjustment plates that I'll talk about in a second there's no limitation to the articulation of the uniball bearings they are rotating along their axis so I have no limitation here 
on my travel range. It makes it very serviceable, they're easy to build, blah, blah, blah. A lot of cool stuff. You see it on like trophy trucks and stuff a lot, having their ball joints mounted this way. I digress. The next thing, the toe arm. These toe arms are the ones that we actually sell online. They bolt right up to this setup. Same body, same inner, all that stuff. Again, very easy to adjust. We have bump steer adjustment options here. Bump steer or toe gain is what we can adjust here at the knuckle. These plates have three positions. The one that it's in currently is the center hole. This one is offset. And then if you flip it, it's offset to the outside or to the inside. That is a plus one or a minus one setting. And the beauty of that is I don't need to adjust anything on the subframe. I can if I have to go beyond what this will get me. But essentially, if I go to a bank track that's left and I was just at a bank track that was right, all I need to do is flip these plates and give myself the negative one degree on the left side and the positive one degree on the right side or vice versa. All of that will be done just by flipping these plates. I don't need to store any plates in my trailer. I don't need to do anything. It's all built in to these. So this kit is actually ready to go. We've sold a couple already to some guys that um, I'm friends with and they can easily run it through its paces along with myself. But track width is the exact same. I measured my axle length. It's identical to factory for a winter's quick change. All of that good stuff. So this has been tried, true, proven, test fitted. The only thing I'm gonna add are a couple holes in the upper for a sway bar. I will be running a sway bar on top of the frame rails, connecting to the upper control arm in this area. Just because of the, where the winner's quick change is, I can't use the factory rear. Plus, I like to tune in my sway bar a lot more precisely than what the uh, OEM one is, is capable of. So it comes with the factory sway bar mount here, but I won't be using that. Last but not least, is our anti-squat bracket. You can see it here installed on the subframe where we currently have it in the lowest anti-squat position. I did an install video on my Instagram where I showed how to drill these holes, where it all mounts to and stuff. But I have the bracket for the other side uh, in my hand. This is what it looks like. So it uses the factory threaded holes in the subframe that the leaf spring used to be in and Fortunately enough, those holes happen to be perfectly 90 degrees to the subframe mount. So conveniently enough, I came up with the design where it picks up those, you thread this into the subframe, and then this slides up into where the camber bolt used to be. This fits nice and snug. Because we're dropping the plate below where the subframe ends, these plates fit nicely up against the subframe and give you an additional hole so that you can run all different types of percentages of anti-squat on this car. Corvettes from factory run a fairly high percentage anti-squat, so having this adjustment is going to be really important to use your suspension properly on a drift car. A couple things we're gonna be doing that are that's totally custom that other people may or may not mimic. I am able to get five inches, or from you metric people, about 125 millimeters of additional shock length, if I connect my strut to the factory mount here, but if I actually cut off the bottom of the coilover mount, put a rod end on it, and I go to this lower control arm pickup point, which is actually directly to the knuckle, it's going to change my motion ratio favorably, and it's also going to give me a much longer range so that I can add more shock and get more travel. Biggest problem with Corvettes, no suspension travel. Corvettes were built for road racing. They're fantastic for road racing. You run stiff sway bar, stiff spring. With drifting, we need droop to maintain good contact throughout all terrains, basically coming off the bank, going on the bank. Transitions, all of that stuff requires a lot of travel range in order to maintain that grip and contact. So I will be doing those modifications I'm currently in discussion with FD as well on building a sellable um, top hat that gives you an additional one or two inches off the factory mount. That's in discussion, because then if I can get seven inches longer of travel, I'll be a happy camper, because uh, my S14 had 160 mil of suspension travel, and I, this car is nowhere near that, and I want it to be there. So. Uh, one more important detail, 
was that I actually moved the mounts where the factory control arms used to attach to the original knuckle. The upper was the same knuckle as the front. The front of the car requires you to have a KPI angle in order to have good self-alignment torque and steering, but since the rear does not steer, you do not need kingpin axis inclination. So I moved the pickup points perfectly in line with each other and I moved them outward. What this does is it gives me longer control arms, upper and lower, but specifically a longer upper. The upper being longer is going to give me a much better camber curve, so much so that there is essentially no camber gain, which is pretty fantastic for drifting. I also put in a ton of roll center correction into the knuckle, which means, again, my camber gain is going to be much better than factory. So those are the last two major benefits that I can think of mentioning in this video that are super important for drifting and super important to note. So I'll throw on the rotor just so you can see how that works. Throwing on the rotor, we've uh, re-drilled these bearings to have 5x114 so we can run those wheels. And the rotors are basically the same front and rear. They are the two-piece rotors from Willwood with a 3 8 disc and I use the same top hat front and rear. It's really handy because the Willwood calipers bolt right to my pickup points. Everything is nice and tight, very close to each other, making it the lightest possible setup I can, I can run. So this whole package is going to be significantly lighter than anything else you could even come close to buying. Factory rotors, factory calipers, they're all heavier than what I'm doing right here. So that's the gist of the rear. I've done a ton of other stuff on the back. As you can see, I cut off the back. I actually have the entire tube rear designed, cut, and ready to build. The whole entire rear is going to be housing my jack, my air jacks, my rad, my fans, and it all integrates and bolts into this rear setup that, that's going to be removable from the car. And it all starts with these plates. These plates are pre-made to fit perfectly on the frame rail. They even have, this is kind of weird, but you can see where this indent was. They fit perfectly on the rear. These holes were literally just because of where it mates, I'm not going to need material there, so it's just weight. After I weld these on, um, I'm going to be able to start the fabrication of the entire rear bash bar with uh, the mount and everything for all my other stuff. So that's going to be cool, but that won't be until the next episode. We have some of our new performance stuff just sitting here, getting an idea of where it's all going to go. That will probably be a video after the tube front and tube rear. I did fit this firewall. It was fantastic. It just kind of pressed in place and then the fit up is kind of comical actually because I put the, the smallest little indentations of the chassis. I actually put them right into the, the cut file. So the fit was just hilariously perfect. I designed this which is going to go here. So I can, if I do need to see out the back for whatever reason, I, I actually can. And then I made these plates. Obviously when you put the firewall in, you have to slot the top of it to clear these. So I designed these plates. They line up with their holes. I'm going to put rivets in the corners and it's a fully sealed firewall. Just like that. I mean, there's a lot going on. It's uh, probably kind of overwhelming for you guys, but it's even more so for me. I'm doing this stuff like every night, put my kids to bed, I get back on my computer and I just start designing stuff and going crazy. So the goal is to have this done sometime middle of March. That's the goal. It's pretty ambitious considering how much work and time these cars take, but I mean, you guys are seeing it happen. So hope you're enjoying it. Um, that's all I got to say, I'm done. That's it, shut her down. Okay, tack the top. Let me see. 89.8 and 89.9. There you go.